Well, good morning. Well, I hope that you're having a great day today. There we go. Check, check, one, two. Hello, hello. All right. I hope you're having a great day today because, uh, but if you're not, we're going to hopefully let, the Lord will let today be a better day. We've got a lot of celebrations to do today. Uh, I don't know if you're aware of this, but we have been through a lot over the last few weeks, uh, especially the last week. And, uh, but we've had people who've been doing some great things over the last few weeks, months, and uh, even years. And before we begin, uh, I want to ask you a question, and then I'm going to do some introductions of some things. And then I'm going to preach a little bit, and I'm going to bring some people up to share some things, and then I'm going to preach a little bit, and then we're going to go home, all right? And we're going to be changed people, amen? So here's what I'd like to do. I'd like to start off by saying this. Uh, we talk a lot about what we're supposed to do in church. We talk a lot about it. A preacher preaches a lot about it. People talk about it in Sunday school. Conversations come up. We know, most of us, the answers as to what we're supposed to do as Christians when it comes to Christian living. And I'm not talking about reading your Bible, which is definitely important. I'm not talking about prayer, which is definitely important. I'm not talking about even sharing the gospel, which is the most important. I'm talking about being able to serve God through the service of others. Now, over the last year, we've had some very special people who have met more than once. They are, they're an emergency team. And uh, I call on them all the time, and that is our church council. And so uh, I'm going to ask if at this time we could recognize the member of the 2016-2017 church council. Uh, Some of them are surprised by this. They had no idea this was coming. Uh, Brother David Barrett, our minister of education, serves on our church council. Will you come forward, please, and uh, put all your notes and your pocket protector and everything down and come on up here. David Barrett, listen, David, we could not do this without you. Thank you so much. I just want to recognize you as a vital part of the church and the church family. Uh, Matthew Griffey is not here, but would you accept this on behalf of your husband? This is uh, Matthew Griffey. This is not Matthew, this is Belinda. Thank you. Edward Johnson, our 2016-2017 church council member. Edward, thank you, brother. Couldn't remember that. And, and, and uh, Merlene Willis. Miss Merlene, it's a long trek from in the back, but come on up here. Uh, Miss Merlene has served as our church clerk. I believe she was clerking for uh, Aaron and Moses uh, and those guys. <laughs> uh, we appreciate appreciate you doing this. Come on up here. If you, can you make it up? These, these, come on, help you get up. Can you, can you just, just hold on to that. I don't let that man help you. That's, this is 2017. You can do it yourself. That's right. Thank you so much. This just to recognize. Miss Merlene is um, not going to be serving on church council this year. She said she had enough of uh, Edward and David and Matthew. So uh, we are excited to. Especially you. And I had enough of them too. You're right. And uh, so she's. But I wanted to recognize you because you have done. She does the minutes for all of our meetings, our called meetings, our our regular meetings. Um, she keeps track of the membership. She she has done a, a lot in the. And she's also a vital part of our decision making. And Miss Merlin, we appreciate all that you did. We got you a couple special gifts, if that's all right. Uh, the first thing we got you here. Um, Let's <laughs> Giving her my truck, that's right. New, we love her, but not that much. Here we go. We, we got you some poker chips. Oh. So that we know that, um, you know. How much are they worth? Uh, it's, it's, I don't know. You'll have to, tell, you have to find out what they are when you go to the casino. And um, we didn't want you to feel like you didn't have something to go along with that poker chip. So. <laughs> I know. <laughs> and along with your uh, your... Uh, poker chips and your your sparkling grape juice for all of you who are wondering what that was. <laughs> it's really Welch's. It's actually very good too. That's right. Um, that's what she says is in it anyway. Uh, this says, "Faithful servant, as a faithful servant of God, you're strengthen, you strengthen, encourage, show your devotion to God by reflecting His love and grace in all you do. God bless you. Well done, good and faithful servant." Matthew twenty five twenty one. We appreciate you very much. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Merlene may as well be our volunteer servant of the year. She has been uh, of the years. We could put the plural on the end of that. She has been amazing, and she's going to keep doing stuff. She's not going anywhere. She's just going to do stuff differently, right? So we appreciate you very much. Um, something else that I want to share with you this morning, a letter from Nell Morris's family. Uh, Dear Chester, thank you and all of the members of Smith Street Baptist Church for the way you ministered to our family when Nell passed away. Again, we were overwhelmed by your kindness and love. The meal was delicious and such a sweet blessing. And the flower, uh, flowers 
that her TEL Sunday School class sent were just beautiful with love and gratitude, Amy, Greg, Andrew, and Jonathan. Uh, that came in the mail this weekend, and I wanted to uh, give that to you and present that to you as well, because these are signs of, of way people are serving and ministering right here in God's church. For those who don't, uh, if you don't get the joke with Merlene, I have been picking on Merlene since I got here um, about uh, having a, a drinking problem and a gambling problem. Um, and, and I thought for the longest time that it was, because it's always been a joke, and, and it is a joke, but till someone one day came up to me and said, uh, you know, I said something about drinking the other day and gambling, and Merlene was standing there, and I was so embarrassed, and I said, why? And they said, because she's got those problems. <laughs> And I realized that I might need to clarify that, that that's been a joke all this time. So, you know, but anyhow, we're glad that, uh, Marlene, we're, we're thankful for you and thankful for all of you who've ministered. Well, the question I asked you is said, we talk a lot about what we're supposed to do, but then do we actually do it when time comes? That's a hard question, but it's one of the most important questions we can ask. Let us stand together and read as we read this morning. We're going to be reading out of Matthew and I, I normally pull up and tell you where this is, but I just want you to listen to me tonight, this morning. I just, instead of reading with it for now, I want you to just pay close attention uh, as you read carefully, or listen carefully, rather. He's talking about sheep and goats. Matthew says this, When the Son of Man comes in His glory, and all the angels with Him, He will sit on His glorious throne All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate the people one from another, as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my father. Take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. I needed clothes, and you clothed me. I was sick and you looked after me. I was in prison and you came to visit me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we you when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and invite you in or needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and go to visit you? The king will reply, truly, I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for this word, and I pray that you will strengthen us as the body of Christ as we recognize the truth, accept conviction, and change that comes with it. Speak, Father, through your spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. So, the question here is, are you sheep or are you goats? Are you sheep or are you goats? Well, I'm going to let you decide what sits among us today, sheep or goats. Connie Clifton, is she a sheep or a goat? Boy, I have so many things running through my mind right now, I want to say. <laughs> Connie, come on forward, come forward if you will, Connie, and, and uh, if you can through your tears that will ine- inevitably come. Connie's going to take a moment, she's going to share a little bit about her mission trip to a land not so far away, uh, Adrian, Georgia, where she was a children's youth, children's camp counselor, <laughs> And uh, with the Daniel Baptist Association. And Connie, please share with me. I'm a crybaby, so if I start crying, y'all just have to forgive me. Um, Just hold that mic really close so we can hear you cry, okay? (laughs) (laughs) This past year, um, we had camp in Adrian, Georgia. We had probably right at 90-something kids. This is one of the lowest camps we've ever had. I've been going for 19 years as a counselor. Um, we have kids aging from the age, uh, ranging from the age seven to fourteen years old. Um, every year I get something out of it. It may not be, but just a little bit. But every year I get something out of it. This year it was time about giving our best to Christ. It said it, our theme was the best of me. Ask me the scripture. I'm to be honest with you. I cannot think of it right now. My brain's just fried from this week. But. Um, what I took away from it, and when I came back from camp this year, I had, a, I had an awakening last year, going through some personal things myself, but this year it, it hit again. No matter what I'm going through, I still have to give the best of me to Christ. Amen. And that's what we taught these kids. No matter what they're going through, they still have to give their best. And whatever they're doing out in the world, they're being a light for Christ. They're shining, and they're making an example 
there being an example for everybody else to follow. <clears throat> like I said, next year will be 20 years. I said I was going to retire after 20 years. I don't think I'll be able to do it. <laughs> um, this year we had a, a young boy, Ethan, that has started coming to church here this year. His stepfather passed away. He, we took him in on a um, scholarship. And just watching his face through this camp this that week was awesome. He was so excited. Um, he was on fire. And through a vacation Bible school this year, he got saved. So we know that whatever we planted at camp this year helped him whenever he became a Christian at VBS. Um, support your local camps. Um, People think just because we're just right here in Adrian or a few miles down the road in Adrian that it's, oh, it's not a big deal. But some of the kids that go there have been going for years. Some of our kids that stop at 14, we call it the dark ages from 14 to 18, then they get to come back as a counselor. You would not believe the way that their life has changed over those years and they're still on fire for God. Um, just support them. Be open-minded when people ask for help. Um, to send kids because some kids can't afford it. Their parents can't afford it. And it's just awesome. It's awesome. And I can't wait to go back next year. Uh -huh. Thank <laughs> Connie is uh, one of our missionaries who goes to Adrian, uh, which is, believe it or not, sometimes when you go out to Adrian, and I've been there, it feels like you're out in the middle of nowhere in another country. Uh, I don't know if any of you live in Adrian, but if you do, you know what I'm talking about. If you've been through there, you know what I'm talking about. If you've never heard of it, that's probably why. Okay, so, uh, but we, we love our campground in Adrian, and, and I got to do that for uh, 12 years, and, uh, and then I got tired of seeing Connie, and I knew she wasn't quitting, so I quit. Um, also, uh, one of our missionaries from the church who's gone a little bit further than uh, Adrian, just a little bit, a couple miles past Adrian, is Haiti. And uh, her name is Kristen Sharp. Kristen, will you come and share with us what God's done through your mission work in Haiti? Let's welcome her, shall we? Uh, just for the record, ladies, I keep a box of tissue right here, okay? Because so, <laughs> I am just like you. You did do good. I know, I saw that. Um, so this was my second year going to Haiti. Um, I was able to go last summer. And then I was able to return again this summer. And um, I, a lot of people have asked me about how my trip went. And I just was, it was a hard trip for me this year. Um, so it's taken me a little bit of time to be able to really talk about how my trip went. Um, to give you a little insight on it, um, whenever I arrived at the airport, it was about 5, 5.30 in the morning. And um, I received a phone call. And um, it was my aunt telling me that my grandfather had passed away. And um, it wasn't really, he had had some health problems, but then we thought everything was okay. And so it was pretty unexpected. And um, so then I had to decide to go to Haiti or go home. And uh, this was a seven night, eight day trip. So I knew that meant that I'd miss everything for him, morning, night, and all of that. So um, my team, um, I couldn't speak to my leader, so I handed him the phone. They explained what was going on, and my team immediately came around me and prayed. And I just had a piece about it, and um, he said, you know, I'm not trying to rush you, but you've got 10 minutes before we have to go on through. And then, you know, at that point, we can get you back, but it'll be pretty difficult to get you back. So um, I sat there for a few minutes, and he was a man of God, and he had just recently told me, about how proud he was of that and that I had gone and done that. So I just decided that there was no better way to honor him and to remember him than to go. And so I went. Um, the questions that a lot of people ask me are, what does it look like over there? And so if you'll go on to that next slide, this is a picture um, the picture on the left is kind of what they live in, and that's really nice. Um, most of the time they just kind of gather in like this open area. Um, the house that you see, there might be like 30 or 40 people that sleep in that. And um, they'll just kind of, there's no, 
it's just a room with a dirt floor. Um, they'll sleep on the floor, or generally they actually sleep outside of it. They only use it whenever it's raining. Um, the picture on the right is a picture of their walls that they make. And it's actually palm leaves that they intertwine and make into a wall. So that's kind of their living conditions there. You can go ahead. Um, a lot of people ask me about water. Um, these are a little blurry because I was on the bus taking these pictures. Um, whenever you're on a bus with um, a lot of blancs, as they call us, which is white, um, you don't always stop and get off to take pictures. You kind of take them as you're going. It's not necessarily the safest thing for us to do to hop off the bus. So um, this is their water. And this is their drinking water, their bathing water. Um, as you're going by, you can actually, there'll be actually people out bathing in this. And so um, then there'll be people washing clothes in this. So you just kind of hope you're closest where it starts off to get the <laughs> clean water. <laughs> you can go ahead. Um, this is what their dirt looks like. Um, they're not really able to grow much. That's just rocks and trash. Um, they can grow plantains and stuff like that, but that's really about it. This is a picture of their family graves. Um, while I was there, I didn't get to meet the guy, but um, we did ride past him. And um, there was a, a long-term missionary there at the orphanage named Charlie. And uh, he was telling me about this guy. It's not this particular one. But um, there, whenever you get so poor that you have nothing left, um, you go and you can live above this. And so uh, their family member is actually underneath that window that you see there. They're actually kind of in the bottom of it. And if you're that poor, then you go and live this. Um, one of the men that uh, I got to hear about um, was a guy who was a voodoo doctor. And um, he had been a voodoo doctor all his life. He was in his late 60s, early 70s is what they guessed. There's not really ages there. Nobody really knows when they were born or anything like that. It's very rare for them to know their birthday. Um, he actually converted to Christianity. And whenever he did, his village kicked him out. He had nowhere to go. So he was living over one of these. And um, about a week after we left, I found out that Mr. Charlie was actually able to find him somewhere to live. So that wasn't over his family's grave. So that was pretty cool that they were able to take care of him and how many people he'll be able to touch just by his village and all seeing that, you know, he converted to that and that he found a better way than voodoo. Um, voodoo is really the religion of preference there, I guess is the best way to put that. Um, so you definitely have to be very careful about the things that you do there because of the voodoo. And um, that's really what you're trying to get people to convert to convert from. So um, you can go on that next one. This is the bus that we travel on. A lot of people ask how we get around, so I just picture, figured I'd put a picture of the bus in there. These are our living quarters. Um, I get asked a lot of times about, well, you know, where do y'all sleep? What, what do y'all do? So I figured I'd show you. Um, we sleep up on the third level. We actually uh, travel to a compound. And on the compound is a, uh, an orphanage and a hospital. And the group that I go with is called Light of Life Missions. And they've been going to this same area for about 15 to 20 years. So over that time span, they've built this up. And um, so we actually have a whole level to ourselves. And this is what it is. It's concrete floor with, you know, the pillars in it and then a metal roof. And you'll see there's no walls. So whenever it rains, it gets a little... Um, wet and um, there's no air conditioner nothing like that so I mean you kind of pray for a breeze to come on through every night so you can get to sleep but it's all just one giant room with a bunch of beds in it that are kind of laid out in a really weird way so generally somebody's feet are in your face you just pray that they got that shower that they said that they got that night and because uh, it's pretty hot over there so by the end of the day we smell great um, but um, a lot of people talk about Haiti and a lot of people don't realize how beautiful it is and how beautiful what I do is 
So um, I did want to share some pictures with y'all of what the land looks like, just so that you don't think that it's all just nasty from what I've shared. Um, you know, you can go on to the next one. Every night we would have a lightning storm, every single night. And you know, we're leaning on these metal rails, we've got a metal roof, and we are sitting here videoing. We're leaning on these rails, trying to lean out and get the best videos we can of this lightning storm. And it's just coming down all around us, but the orphanage was always protected. Um, even whenever Hurricane Matthew hit, the orphanage was protected. Um, this year with Irma, I was so nervous. If y'all are my friends on Facebook, I don't apologize for sharing as much as I did about it because Irma just went right over the top of Haiti. It was supposed to go right over it and just destroy it, and it just went right over the top of it and come back around. So I know that there were some people praying for that. Um, while we were there, some of the things that we did were um, VBS. Um, this is one of this is day three or day four of our VBS. The way we done it was we went to two different villages. Um, this is Mahu, is the village we're in right now. Um, I cannot pronounce the name of the other village, and I'm really not even going to try, but it starts with a G. Um, one of the things that we done was we would do a lesson every day, and then you can go on to the next one. We would do crafts, and um, these are like, we ordered in a bunch of crafts from, uh, I don't know where you get them from, like VBS crafts that we would do here too, and took them over with us in huge subware containers. Um, one of the things about traveling there is that we pray over every single container that we take because if these were to be opened and they were to see Jesus and God and Bible and all that stuff written on it, more than likely they would all be taken. They would take our food. They would take all of it. So um, whenever people ask me, you know, what can we pray for? Um, just for future reference, you can pray over these containers because so far that's never happened. Um, generally, whenever we get there, for whatever reason, every time they are rushed and they just put our straight through and don't even open them. Now, they'll be opening everyone else's around us, and uh, but they don't open ours. So, yeah, it gives me chills just talking about it right now because I know that how bad of a mess we would be in if we went and they took our containers because that's literally our food for the week. Um, that's everything for the whole week. So it's a blessing to even be able to show you these pictures and the, these crosses that these kids decorated during VBS because I know how big of a deal it was to get across that border with these. So um, these are just a picture of the crosses they would make. Um, every day we would have rec time. Um, they enjoy playing soccer, and one of the things I found most interesting is that they would make something out of nothing. They took rocks and um, built to make goals. And on the way to the very first day of VBS, I had the task of blowing up the soccer ball. I broke the needle off in the soccer ball trying to blow up the first one, and that was all we had for rec time. And my brother Fred said, you're supposed to lick it. I was like, no, I'm not licking that. And I just went ahead and put it in there, tried to blow it up, and it broke off in it. And he was like, no, you were really supposed to lick it. I was like, I'm not licking this needle. We're in Haiti. I have no idea where this thing is being. So I didn't lick it. And on the ball, it actually says you're supposed to lick it. He wasn't lying. And so I felt so horrible because all we had for rec time for four days of VBS for over 200 children was these two soccer balls, and I just messed up the only way to blow these things up. Well, Haitians, they know how to fix anything, so we passed the ball back to our translators, and would you know, somehow or another, I still haven't figured out how they've done it, they blew up those soccer balls, and we had soccer balls. So, Amen. yes, I feel pretty bad about that, but I was glad God came through right there. <laughs> Because the worst thing you want is 200 Haitian children storming you, all wanting to be held because you have no other activities for them. Um, another thing that we did each day of VBS was give our testimony. And um, this is a picture of me and one of the other um, women that went on the trip with me giving our testimony. And um, it also shows you a little bit about the churches we were in. The one on the left is the one that starts with a G. And the one on the right is Mahu. Um, 
these communities, whenever they're actually able to convert whole communities to Christianity, these communities will come together and they will put everything that they have, they will sell everything that they have, get rid of everything that they have just to have money to build a church. Everything that they have goes to the church. So um, whenever they're actually able to get a church, you know, we'll have some groups will come in, some construction <coughs> groups will come in and help them. But these people really give everything that they have to their church. And it just, their love for Christ just, it, it really humbles me because I realize that, you know, would I sell my family's food for the church? Would I sell my family's food for, you know, that cement to go in between them concrete blocks? You know, I mean, the faith that they have is just mind-blowing because they see that God does protect them, that God sends them food. Did I die? Um, you can go on to the next picture. Um, the day Mahu was the second village that we went to, and um, it was kind of cool because I'll show you. You'll see on the next picture a little better. But whenever we first started, we walked in Mahu. This is our second village. You know, we've got two days of VBS here, and there are four kids. And we were like, oh, boy, what happened? There are only four kids here. Okay, all right. So then we wait, we're like, we'll wait an hour. We waited an hour and then there were five kids. So then the pastor comes out, the pastor of the church comes and he was like, where are all the kids, you know? And we're like, we don't know, you know, we thought you were going to get them to come. So he brings out this drum and hands to uh, our leader, Brother Fred, and he says, sing and beat the drum. We're like, you know, no, we're, we'll sing later. We've got that scheduled for later. And he's like, no, 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 sing and beat the drum. So we sing and beat the drum. You can go on to the next one. And this is what happened. Yes. So we ended up having over, I think, about 120 children here. But throughout the whole day, that just kept trickling on in. Same thing happened the next morning. We started out with about 20. So we started beating that drum. He didn't even have to come tell us that morning. And uh, they just started pouring in. So that was pretty awesome to see. And um, he says that they use that all the time, that um, whenever he has a message, he just starts beating that drum and people come and hear it. So that was pretty awesome to me. Um, you can go on to the next one. This is our, the church, the other one that we went to. And you can see their churches, how nice they are compared to where they live. I mean, a lot of these families do not even have the picture that I showed you earlier. They don't even have that concrete building. You know, all they have is those walls of the palm leaves, and that's what they live in. So for this church to look like this and to walk outside and see the pictures that I've showed you earlier just shows you how important their church is to them and how much they just strive to learn more about God, to know more about God, and they just love whenever we come in and we have even more messages for them. And they love for their children to be taught about God. So... It's kind of awesome to go in here and for the parents to just say thank you, thank you, thank you. You know, over and over, thank you, thank you, thank you for affecting my child's life. It's just, it's really a great feeling to know that um, you're really impacting these children's lives and these parents' lives. So um, you can go to the next one. So what we do to give back to them is we give them rice and some other goodies. Um, we'll take the whole week to bag up all this rice and put it in gallon-sized bags so that each child can go home with a whole bag of rice. Um, the children on the right are toting these big whole bags of rice, and that's just a gallon bag, and it looks huge compared to these little kids. Um, on the left, we also have some uh, stuff that the tribe uh, members put together. It was um, <coughs> a toothbrush, toothpaste, um, I think some body wash or a soap, um, a rag, and some chapstick. And so each child from Mahu got sent home with a bag of rice and one of these care packs. And they were so excited. They were running to their parents, look, 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 you know, because these children come to VBS, 
they were gifted with this, and that's how God provided their food for the week because that's probably all they'll eat for a month or two is that one bag of rice. Um, at the other village, um, we handed out bears. And uh, these bears were made by Crafters for Christ. Um, I got some fabric and brought to them, and they did everything else. And it just blew my mind what they were able to do with just some fabric. I, there's no way I'd be able to do all that. But they made these bears, and on the front of them it says, Jose Raymond, which means Jesus loves you. And so each child from the from that village that come to our VBS got to take home a bear that says Jesus loves you. So even if those parents were not Christians, we just brought a little piece of that VBS into their home, you know, and it's a conversation piece so that that child can, you know, maybe the parent says, well, what is this? And the child can tell them because that day we talked about how much Jesus loved you and how that he gave his life for you. And so we gave to be able to stand up there and give those children a way to talk to their parents was awesome. And Crafters for Christ really came through on that one. Um, every night we have a VBS for, or excuse me, a devotion for ourselves. And different people lead it. And so this was just kind of a picture of that. Um, you can go to the next one. Uh, the orphanage we're at every single night, whether there's a team there or not, um, they do a devotion there. And uh, one of the nights I was actually asked to lead it, and so that was awesome. Um, they Only a few of them speak English, so anytime you get up and talk, you have to have a translator. And that's real fun, trying to translate what that emotion and what the, the message that you're trying to bring through a translator for a different language um, is definitely interesting. But um, they get it, you know. It's... Love doesn't need a translator, and that's what I say all the time in Haiti. You know, I'll, even though I don't speak Creole fluently, um, love doesn't need a translator. You know, I can walk up to someone and hug them and say, you know, Jesus loves you, and they understand that. So that's always been pretty awesome to me. Um, these are back to the church. Um, these are some how they dress for church and. Like, I talked to y'all earlier about how hot it was, but I just want y'all to understand that, like, this year it only got to about, like, 104, I think, was the highest. Um, last year it got up to 108. And generally, I don't know why, but it, it always seems to happen the last day we're there, which is the day we go to church, um, to actually a Haitian church and go to their church service. And these are how everybody dresses. I mean, most of the men will actually be in suits and ties. The women will be in dress suits as well. And it's 100 degrees in these places. And there are, there's no electricity or anything like that. So it just goes to show again um, the love that they really have and the respect that they have for God. That they want to do their best to please him. And even though they might not have food that week, they're going to look good at church. You know, because they want to give God their absolute best. Um, that's really about all I have to say. I mean, I don't want y'all to get out late or anything. <laughs> I don't want it to be my fault this time we're out late. Um, this is the group that I went with this year. And um, I just really want to tell the church thank y'all. Because without y'all, I wouldn't have been able to go. I wouldn't have had the strength to get up every morning and go on, you know, knowing that my family was here morning. Um, but this year, I just really wanted to make it more. I wanted to make it more meaningful. And um, I really jumped out of my comfort zone and did those devotions and shared my testimony and led Bible studies. And um, if that hadn't been for you guys sending me, I wouldn't have been able to do that. So thank y'all. If you open up to Matthew 25 as we wrap up, that was the section of scripture I had you listen to earlier. Now I want you to read it this time with me. Matthew 25, verse 31. And you're going to read this through as we read it, as I read out loud and you read silently. When you think of the stories that you've heard taking place just down the road in Adrian and the impact on hundreds of children over 19 years of ministry. And then the impact on hundreds of children and families over just two years in Haiti. 
Verse 31 out of Matthew 25. When the Son of Man comes in His glory and all the angels with Him, He will sit on His glorious throne. All the nations will be gathered before Him and He will separate the people one from another as shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will put the sheep on His right and the goats on His left. Then the King will say to those on His right, Come, you who are blessed by My Father. Take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry... And you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you invited me in. I needed clothes and you clothed me. I was sick and you looked after me. I was in prison and you came to visit me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and invite you in or needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and go to visit you? The king will reply, truly I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. Now, you have heard some stories about what these folks have done in their ministries for the least of these. And believe me, in Adrian, Connie has seen some of the least of these. And in Haiti, Kristen has seen some of the least of these. But some of the least of these were affected just this past week in our community. And on any given day, we could become some of the least of these. Kristen was out here at the, at the shelter serving in a mighty way. And she said later she was amazed at how quickly, or either you said this or, or Heather said this, maybe it was you, but I think we'll give you credit, um, that she was amazed how quickly she went from being the one who was doing the serving to the one who was being served when she got a phone call and a tree had fallen through her mother's house. And thankfully everyone was okay, but the house is not. The foundation is messed up and the sewage had busted. And so, and had they been, if I understand and correct me, had family members been in certain places of that house, it might have been bad. Sitting up under where the tree came in. And he's sitting here today. Praise God. Amen. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Could be a whole different story. Now, what was she doing up here serving? Well, a lot of you served in many ways. You have to recall that when the storm was supposed to be headed right for us in the eye of the hurricane, and it was a Category 3, and it was supposed to hit us square in the nose, and And then it began to shift that we were actually not an evacuation zone because we were expected to be hit pretty hard. We were hit, but we were expected to be hit a lot harder by the hurricane. And so initially there was no evacuation to Vidalia or Toombs County because Vidalia and Toombs County was somewhere you needed to run from. And uh, as the storm began to shift more to the west, it still put us in great danger because of the top uh, right quadrant of the storm and the tornadic activity that was expected But our EMA director and a a local uh, citizen contacted me and they said, will you open your church as a, 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 uh, yeah, a humanitarian shelter. But they said instead of opening the church, actually I was debating whether or not I kept the stream or not, to be honest with you. I may not want this next part recorded. Bye. 